So I'm Peter Sommerlaat, and uh, who else I am? I'm professor for software engineering, teaching C++ and all kinds of stuff around software engineering since the last 15 years. So before, I also published in the area of uh, patterns, patterns for software architecture, for example. There's a book, right, a book out that has beyond, uh, b uh, besides other names, also my name on the cover. Um, and today, I figured out yesterday that my topic would be sane modern special member functions. That was after I actually prepared the talk sane and safe C++ class types, which contains that as a subset, which is good, so I could delete some of my slides and actually talk about what we are supposed to talk about. But the problem when you uh, submit so many talks to so many conferences like I usually do, you end up having uh, the problem that you forget what you wanted to talk about. Who has been to my talk yesterday? Okay, most of you. So I, at least some of you are repeat cu uh, customers or repeat listeners. And who has been to the uh, lightning talk yesterday night? Also some repeat people. So that's, um, this is something that has nothing to do with the uh, talk, but nevertheless, I wanted to show that to you. It's uh, Patricia As, um, Ask a question about C and C++ programs on uh, kind of a, a poll on Twitter on what, what typical problems you get when you write C++. And it was user after free, uh, memory leaks, double free delete, double deletes, or null pointer dereference. And this is kind of a distribution of what uh, people actually replied, what their most common error is. And then there was some discussion on that. And Michael, he's not here, he said, I don't see th of these anymore. And the thing is, we have mechanics in C++ that we don't actually have these problems, except for one. And I also replied, none of the above. And why? Yeah. There are other people who do that, but not everybody is there yet. So whenever you get one of these four, or at least three of these uh, problems, you have a problem in your code base not uh, that is beyond just this individual problem. So. Most C bugs are 100% avoidable in modern C++, except for the nagging thing like, let's call it their use after free, which is, I call dangling. So you put up the gallows and hang yourself if you use a dangling reference, which can be a pointer or some other means uh, of view. We have now in C++ 17 and 20 even more means of provide dangling values because of views and span. So be careful. But all the other things, memory leaks, in my opinion, today's code should never have, today's C++ code should never have a, a memory leak. We have unique pointers, we have containers, and we have values, and they just work. Double free delete, again, unique pointer, containers, values. Null pointer dereference, I would say it's 100% avoidable because we have values, passed by value, we have references who cannot be null, and we might even employ automatic checks like uh, the core guideline support library GSL now. What we shouldn't use is plain pointers and C style arrays. Except, as I uh, talked about yesterday, sometimes you need these things. But you better go in a tight closet and lock the door when you're doing things like that and never show to anybody else that you have uh, plain pointers or C arrays somewhere. So, for example, you would implement vector with pointers, but you never tell anybody that there are pointers. Now, I try to put up with two dimensions. It's sanity and safety. I work with people on the... Uh, the automotive industry to write guidelines or spell out guidelines for modern C++ for safety criti critical code. And there are some areas in C++, we have this sane and safe part that's easy to use, nothing can go wrong. And the language mechanics support th that we can get there. Easy to use, completely safe, 
nothing can go wrong, maybe except resource exhaustion in, in a very tiny system. And then there are areas that are, okay, we need to use them, but we need to use them with care. So we have to pay attention to what we use. We have to wear a hard hat in some areas so that we don't bump ourselves. And then there are things that are somehow still sane-ish, but very, very dangerous. So they require extra care, no smoking around the explosives that you have, for example. And then there are areas where I would say, don't go there. Never ever do that anymore. And if you have code doing that, refactor away from doing so. There are also things that are not really unsafe, but still very ill-advised. I'm not, not using a word like uh, insane because that uh, is some other things. And these ill-advised practices that might still work can end up poisoning your code base. Because they might involve patterns that are repeated over and over again. And once they are spread out in your code base, you end up with having a big mess that it's hard to refactor away from because everybody assumes that it's done that way, even if that way is ill-advised. So uh, I just learned this week from a code base where, a ba where one class actually had almost 200 V tables, not V table entries, but V tables. I don't say uh, any, anything else. I just uh, say they were really in that area. Something ill-advised happened and it spread out. You don't get 190 V tables, that meaning at least having 190 base classes somewhere in the uh, hierarchy that you uh, build up. It's really something ill-advised. Now, to make it manageable, C++, when you write a class type, allows a lot of degrees of freedom what you can actually do. And a lot of them, you end up either here, here, or here. Now, we want to be in that quadrant as most as possible. And to make some uh, better understandability, what kind of class types you intend to write is the, the major things, or the, the most common thing that you should use is value types because values just work. They come in the upper right corner. Uh, the other thing that might be very useful and we're, that are very safe because usually nothing can go wrong are empty types. And those of who, you who have been to the keynote this morning, there have been a lot of empty types that have been hanging around there, uh, even including function types with function declarations that have never have a body. So that's a means of working with empty types, and they just work. And then we still need state. We don't, no, don't only have values, and state is often managed somehow, and we have uh, things that I call managing types. A managing type usually owns other values or objects and manages the lifetime of these objects. And I will go into more detail what kind of managing types is. Vector, for example, is a managing type that fortunately also ha is a value type. Or a unique pointer is a managing type because it cleans up afterwards. And then we have one area, it's object-oriented polymorphic hierarchy types. I grew up programming in the 80s and 90s and then object orientation was one of the big things. It was the thing to, the first thing to actually write your own types, that was topic of yesterday. But hierarchies, OO polymorphic hierarchies in C++ are heavily overused in my opinion. Even in the standard library, and they are still there because of legacy, but actually ch exchanging stuff at runtime, adhering to a common interface is quite rare. And with std variant, we even have another mechanism to provide that when you have a fixed set of variations. And then there's a semi-sane area where we have these potentially dangling object types or things that 
that are th types re refer to other objects and their valid validity depends on the lifetime of that other object. It's like, consider you're married or in a partnership and your personal sanity depends on your partner. When your partner passes away, sad as it is, it might actually make, give you a problem. Consider that. You not, don't want your, par uh, to, your, your, your partner object that you refer to, that you hang on to, to die before you die. Might be not a very good uh, <laughs> metaphor, but <laughs> at least it's something you, that should be able, you should be able to remember. Care about your partners or the things you rely on or you refer to. And that's, that's what, what takes a lot of... Um, discipline and practice. So back to the topic of the talk that I discovered yesterday that was the actual topic of my talk. We have special member functions. Special member functions are constructor, copy constructor, copy assignment, move constructor, move assignment and destructor. So we have around, if you count the default constructor as well, six special member functions that usually a compiler provides for us when we define a class type. That's just there. And the best rule that is currently modern and that what I try to tell you to use is the rule of zero. Usually the compiler does the same thing and the safe thing that you actually get exactly what you need by the compiler provided special member functions. And the interesting thing is code that, you, that is not there is usually cannot be wrong. There are some exceptions to the rule, but in general, code that you don't write has no bugs. And that's very important to remember because there are guidelines out there for good C++ code that tell you to write more code that is actually automatically provided for you by the compiler. Don't do that. Throw it away. You have less bugs or less chances for bugs. Then there is the famous rule of three by Scott Myers. Who has heard of the rule of three? Okay. All, who has not, never heard of the rule of three? Okay. All, almost all are old enough. And that's a classic and it came, came from a time pre C++11 when we had the situation that you wanted to implement a class where you actually need to define a destructor or a copy operation. Scott Myers discovered, okay, when you have one of those, copy constructor, copy assignment, or a destructor, you actually should define all three because they are in interdependent. If you have a destructor that cleans up stuff, if you just copy the object, the cleaning up might have uh, happened twice. And if the cleanup is a delete or a free, that is something you don't want to happen in your program for the same resource. There's a variation. Sometimes if you have object orientation uh, hierarchies, if you copy these objects, let's say a derived class to a base class variable, then you have object slicing, which can lead to surprising results, especially if you have developers that come from languages where you have implicit references and not implicit values, then you end up having a sliced uh, object that is only partially copied and you might lose uh, the uh, actually original source, uh, uh, source of the type that you used. So what you typically would do in the variation of Scott Meyer's rule is you define for a virtual base class a virtual destructor with its default behavior and then prevent copying of these class hierarchy objects by declaring copy assignment and copy constructor as protected or private. Because then the compiler cannot automatically apply them when copying objects, so copying would not happen and that's a good thing. If you declare the copy <coughs> constructor private, what else happens to your class? What is 
provided for, to you or not provided to you? Pre C plus plus eleven. I, I have to check my mouse pad. Uh, move operations get disabled. But that's a di different. Uh, I said pre C plus plus eleven. What happened then? The default constructor is no longer provided by the compiler because you already defined or declared a constructor. Even if it's not usable, the default constructor is, is gone. Now, going back to the more recent uh, uh, history, when C11 introduced move operations, we now, instead of just three special member functions, actually four, including the default constructor, we now have five, respectively, six special member functions. And what people after knowing Scott Meyer's rule of three came up with, okay, if I have either one of those, I declare all six or five. Which in my opinion, in a general idea, is not a very good idea because it's very easy to define them in a way that is not correct, if you defi actually define them. And also to maybe, uh, provide them where you don't want to provide them. And this is one of the topics of my talk. And then we have the rule of define destructor, delete the move assignment, which some of you will know from yesterday night, and I will go more in, into detail later. So let's go back to our class categories, values. And Scott Myers had this nice saying, when in doubt, do as the ins do. But the ins also have some problems, so maybe not always, but try as good as possible. So value types, we also have the term in the, or the concept of regular type, which is a value type that is even more useful um, because it also includes ordering. But in general, a regular type, you can compare it. If you copy it, the comparison actually is, should be equal. It should be default constructible, movable, even if that is just a copy, swappable, assignable, and move constructible. And if you don't do anything except for the comparison, you get all these operations for free. It just works. Now, in C++ 20, sometimes we need to define the ordering, so that's the regular part, not the semi-regular, semi so we should uh, be able to have a standard less working either by specializing it or by defining a less than operator and then having all the comparisons consistent might require some additional work so it's a kind of tedious there is a claim that c20 the spaceship operator will make things more easy from what i learned from the past uh, two three years since we considered spaceship it might actually change that to make it differently. Because actually specifying spaceship correctly for a user-defined type might not be that simple unless the compiler provides you with one, which is one of the new features of C20, which might also not be exactly what you want to have. Now, going back to our landscape of sane and safe and, well, ill-advised and dangerous stuff. We can put our value types in this corner and if you, the, there are other types like the managing types, the pointing types or the potentially dangling types or all polymorphic types and I already told you plain pointers, don't use them anymore. Plain pointers that are even owning Refactor, use unique pointer, you're back to a managing type that cannot dangle. If you consider where should be in double and bool in that area. Any ideas? I'm trying to point a quadrant. Are they here? Sa safe but ill-advised. Who's for that quadrant? Okay. Sane but, or let's say, ill-advised but dangerous. Why? Because, they, 
you were have been to my talk yesterday. So yesterday the topic was okay, ins and doubles are might not be good as uh, um, uh, function parameters, but let's consider: are they really dangerous? Are they sane and dangerous? Some. Are they sane and safe? And a lot of people have no opinion. <laughs> so let's see what what happens. I consider that these built-in types, almost exactly in that uh, order, are quite can be quite dangerous and can be also semi-ill-advised. And we learned yesterday, or we could have learned yesterday, that these, let's say, built-in types for representation should actually be wrapped in your own type in your domain, in your application, for each of the roles that they play, so applying the whole value pattern. And for those who watch this video, take the other video as well and learn about the whole value pattern. Now, since I said everything is just a value type and you can construct your own value types, that's not that big of a problem, should I actually make them default constructible? And that's a question you should actually consciously ask yourself and that's the thing is, whenever there's a natural default or neutral value in your type's domain, they should be default constructible. Like in int, if I default construct an int, I get zero, which is not bad because that makes it easy to write generic code because a default constructible, uh, uh, constructed uh, floating point value is also zero and a default constructed string object is an empty string, which is also good. But it depends on what you kind of operations your t value type should support. Sometimes a zero is not the best uh, version of your default value. So consider that correctly. And if you, let's say, have a, a user-defined type that wraps an integer and you use that ma mainly for multiplication, maybe your default value should be one. And uh, member initializers just provide, uh, allow that to, uh, to provide the, uh, this default value of one without having to actually spell out a defaulted uh, or a default constructor. There are some situations where initialization is kind of a complicated thing and you don't want to, you want to have a variable first and then do some conditional expression to figure out what the variable is. And then to actually get that variable, you, you need to default, be able to default construct it. Or you want to have an array of those things and the array only works when it's default constructable. That's not true for vector, but for a std array. Now, I say maybe, and it's kind of an orange uh, traffic light there, because there are options to use like an in place lambda, but if that is more than one line or two, it's also maybe ill-advised. You could do use a factory function to actually construct the value or the arguments for the uh, constructor. And you might actually use a conditional operator if that's a, a simple condition to in, uh, initialize the variable. So I think you should avoid having a default initialization when there is no uh, good neutral value and you have some kind of complex uh, init, uh, initialization. There has been let's say one of the ill-advised things in the 1990s was, okay, defaults construct an object and then have an init method. Anybody have written code like that? Anybody suffered from writing code like that? Anybody still suffers from having code like that? Two-phase initialization is not C++ style of doing the thing. So that's exactly the case where actually you should initialize well. And there are also value types where there is no good default. Like, oh, I'm implementing a poker card deck. What should be the default poker card? A random one? That gives all lot of uh, dependencies to random number engines that you don't want to have in, in a default constructor. Do you? Yeah. 
can you use the microphone? I, first, I cannot hear that gentleman, and I might not be able to. Uh, it's actually throwable. Yes, that's a microphone. Uh, I think the best choice is to have a new stage for such types, because from my experience, uh, the type default uh, uh, default constructor default constructor is a big pain. You practically you need to wrap and be a uh, optional or something like this in the label type uh, just to use it. Because that the question is. It's very tricky to use such type. So let me repeat the question. This gentleman uh, wants to uh, claims that if a type is not default constructible, it's hard to use. But if it's your domain value, you should better consciously decide what the default value should be. And for poker cards, I say, don't do it. If it's hard to use, if you want to have an empty representation, the solution today is use standard optional or maybe even boost optional if that is better suited for your environment. So if there is no default value and you don't have a value, optional is exactly the solution you want to apply. And not a null pointer, like a pointer return. But that's a different talk. So I object to your objection, <laughs> which is my, my uh, let's say, my ability as a speaker. But there are other areas where the default constructible thing is actually dangerous. Consider you have a class representing a cryptographic key. What should be the default key that you generate? A key that is, let's say, has a bit pattern of zeros is a not, not a, usually not a very good key. Its entropy is quite bad and it's not really useful for that. So a cryptographic key should actually never have a default constructor because you want to have a constructor that more or less obtains entropy for so from somewhere to have a, a decent cryptographic key. Or you might uh, get the, key, the key value from outside, but that's a different story. But never have a, a, a default constructible. And now I'm in a domain where Jason will kill me, but um, oh, uh, pass the mic, throw it across the room. It shouldn't hurt. <laughs> I was just going to add that I uh, didn't agree with you because the issue with if there's no obvious default, may I allow people to recall there's a university in the US where there's a very famous maker of routers who put who fixed their NTP server IP address in there. So of course what they had is they had some class with a server IP address, they needed the default, they stuck this key in. The code got shipped to production. Now this university has to put apply blocking because it's getting a denial of service on its NTP server. Avoid defaults when there's no change. Okay, that was a nice story about uh, having bad defaults and then not having a default constructor is a valuable feature, and that's a good thing to do. And to get rid of the default provided default constructor, you have to delete it, but usually would have another dis constructor anyway to construct a real value, and that would mean that you uh, no longer have a, a compiler provided default constructor. Second category. So values are great. And we learned yesterday how to make your own value types that are simple enough. And the other class types that don't go wrong usually are empty classes. There are nice songs about, like you don't get something for nothing. Uh, and there was a talk by Kevin Henney 20 years ago, actually, something for nothing, or maybe a paper of that. But you can uh, try your fa uh, most favorite search engine to find that. And in C++, you actually get something for nothing from empty classes, even if it's comp compiled time regular ex expressions. Have we have seen plenty of those this morning. Now, what are uses for empty types? And again, we have seen one of uh, those uses yesterday in my talk. It's occurring, recurring template parameter pattern mix-ins. So the P is parameter, and, and there's a pattern or idiom, and then there's mix-ins. And 
This works well and actually don't add any overhead because of a thing in the a language that calls empty base class optimization. That's actually required to work. Uh, and in C17, there are even more chances to apply empty base class optimization. And in C20, we even get that empty optimization for uh, class members. Another thing that we are using for uh, empty base types is tags and traits, which is more or less most of the stuff that we have seen this uh, morning with the compile time regular expressions. Now, let's go into some examples, and we still have plenty of time. This is more for, uh, let's say, those who are not uh, C++ programmers for 20 years now, but just a reminder, we have things like iterated tags that even form a hierarchy that is not having virtual member functions and allows us to actually do dispatch on the type of an iterator category and to get there, we have that iterator traits template to actually uh, obtain that iterator category and by making it a value. Again, something we seen this morning uh, exactly here. And this is old code. It's copied directly from a standard library implementation and adapted to fit on the slide. We have that iterator today. I would spell there curly braces to avoid getting uh, into issues with the most vexing pars. We have also other trait or special marker types like in place T for optional that allows us to specify, oh, I want kind of an in place construction of the object that the optional represents. And there's no simple means to specify that to avoid copying uh, an object that already exists into the option uh, or create a temporary and, and copy that into the optional. We want to avoid the move operation, for example. We have two other types in the standard live or in the standard, which is null pointer t and null pointer as a value of that. And they're almost like these tag type or special types, but they aren't really there because they are not empty and the null pointer has, has actually a value. Then we have traits, compiled time media programming. Who in this room has never done metaprogramming? Only a few. So all the others, please uh, turn off your hearing aids, pull plugs in your ears, because you know all of that. We have things where we can actually represent values as types. We have true type, false type, which are very common in metaprogramming for enable if or uh, other things, which is now more or less uh, in some areas superseded by if cons x, where we have ratios to actually represent rational numbers at compile time and distinguish different representations of durations. And we have things like integer sequence that also was shown by others uh, just yesterday by Michael Kess um, for, let's say, generically picking values from an arbitrary tuple. And what else? We have Sphenae, where we have template specialization selection, where we might use these trait types and overload selection, and on and on and on. <laughs> and I don't want to go into the detail of what the code is on that slide. We have type traits to actually write better code to figure out if something is integral not integral, if it's a reference, which is sometimes important for, uh, let's say, enable if in something. For example, the um, unique resource type, if it gets past the reference uh, type as the resource, it will wrap that into uh, a reference wrapper to be able to actually be assignable and uh, resettable. And the other things that we uh, do if you're not yet up to C17. Remember, we will have, or we have in C 17, a lot of variable op variable templates. Instead of having to write the colon colon value to access the compile time value or colon colon type, we have either the underscore v versions 
in from C17 on for the variable templates for true, usually true or false type. That's what we are working with. And we have the uh, underscore T versions uh, of the traits where you don't have to spell type name and colon colon type. We can use the traits also to compute new types, uh, like uh, using remove uh, reference or remove uh, or using decay to get rid of all the uh, uh, things, uh, remove all extends uh, for arrays to get to the underlying type. We have things to actually <coughs> get the corresponding signed or unsigned type for another uh, for type that is signed or si unsigned. So if I don't know how big my int is, I can actually use make unsigned to figure out uh, what the corresponding unsigned type is. Or if I have generic code, I might not know that. And I want to make, let's say, uh, safe integer implementations. I might actually want to, to have the corresponding unsigned type to the signed type that I'm getting. And we can actually build new types, like adding L value references, adding cons, and adding pointers, and that's all kind of things that the, you would do in syntax. You can actually do with type tra with these compile time programming features, and you better don't do it if you can just spell out the syntax. I've seen people learning about these things here and then starting to create their types like that. In normal user code, don't. That is one of these ill-advised things that's poisonous. Once you have an organization where C++ is not that well known, and then someone sees an article about, oh, I have these things, and tries starting that, and everybody else, because that's a guru now, because he read that article or blog post, everybody is using that. Don't fall into that trap and get, get an eye for these traps. Whenever something looks strange, question it. Even if you have no idea what you're doing, question it. Because your gut might tell you what's wrong. Where your brain says, OK, it's written by, let's say, Jason. And he did so great talks at ACCU, I believe he always writes the best code ever, which might be true. But even he might make a mistake. I make mistakes every day. Sometimes I recognize them myself. Sometimes I recognize them when I show it on a presentation in a slide like this. And be careful. One thing to take home, don't trust your own code and don't trust others' code unless you understand it, which is another guideline that I give you. Write code that is easily understandable for those who know the language. And if you don't know the language yet, learn the language before writing complicated code. Or if you learn it to do better, refactor your code to make it simpler. Simple code is one of the, my lifetime goals to achieve. And it should be yours as well. No bloat. Now, going back to empty classes after preaching like that. We have this empty base class optimization. But if I write an empty class, what I actually get? Oh, its size of is not zero. And that's by the language rules. There must be something. If I have an empty object, there must be something. So it must be able to, to have an address. But it actually doesn't need any bit to represent any value because it only has one value, the type, which is the default constructed type element. And to just have one value, you don't need any bit, no, nothing to distinguish. If we, combine, if we now have a plain type, plain wrapper around an int. Actually, the good thing is, unless you write virtual somewhere, which you shouldn't, in my opinion, in most cases, it's exactly the same type of the rep member variable. Now, if we start combining these things, we can figure out that this empty type, very often you use private inheritance for that, but that's just to, to show it here something, it stays now the empty type more or less vanishes. I inherit from it, but it vanishes, which is a good thing. That's how a lot of these uh, things actually work. And that's very often used to optimize away the size of something that's defaulted. For example, a unique pointer with a, with a default deleter, which is a default, like its name, 
will have the same size of the plane pointers. That's the minimum you get because it needs to refer to the resource it manages, the memory uh, it, it manages. So there's magic there. If you get the default T-leader, actually it will be inherited from and it doesn't have any state. It just has a uh, 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 an operator overlo uh, overloaded, the call operator overloaded. And that's just there. Uh, I have an implementation or suggested whenever you use um, malloc and freeze still in a code base to wrap that with the also unique pointer and there have been some examples on Stack Overflow that added an additional pointer to the free function which is actually not undefined behavior because you cannot just take an address of a standard library function. It works but it's not guaranteed to work. So that is wrong plus overhead because you you would then would have two pointers for each pointer to actually to be freed. If you have just one, it doesn't really matter. But if you have hundreds of those, or thousands, or millions, or billions, then size matters, and saving half of the size is actually worthwhile. And uh, that's uh, what you can achieve by more or less implementing the same trick with the uh, deleter that is a class and not just a function pointer. As I said, in C++20, we have that you know unique address attribute, which allows us to, instead of this private inheritance, to have an empty member to get some of its features without actually adding to the size of the class. But as with all things that look, look nice and uh, seem to be free, there are situations where you can unintentionally disable them. And just yesterday, or the day before, or maybe the day before when I um, worked on my code of the talk yesterday on the PSSST library, I, fig I wrote a piece of code where I disabled empty base class optimization. And suddenly my objects were bigger than I intended to them to be. And what, what can happen? The C++ standard says each individual object needs to have an address and if you have the, and you can have let's say this uh, different objects having sharing the same address if they are empty or an empty object sh share its address with something that's non empty but it doesn't work if you have two different objects of the same type they are not allowed to ch share the same address and there are reasons for that. It's in the lifetime model of the C++ language. I just consider these objects, even if they are, they are empty, they have a destructor. And if something is destructed as an address or destroyed, and then something else wants to destroy the same thing again at, at the same address, it's kind of a, a weird thing, and that should better not happen. Now, how to detect that? So whenever you rely on empty base class optimization, Write a static assert with the size of what you actually expect. And to see when it fails, this is a class where we have a base class that is empty, and the first member variable is also of that type empty. In that case, the it's a standard layout. It says, OK, we have a base class which is empty, so I might actually don't uh, give it space. But then it cannot have this occupy the same space as an empty object, uh, as, an, as an object of this identical type, which is called empty here, which actually gives us the problem that our <laughs> would be empty base class optimized class is actually bigger because due to alignment, this E requires space, and we have we cannot have empty base optimization here, and it's not the size of an int. Now this gets even more complicated if we have this empty. We get a deeper hierarchy where it again inherit from empty and have an EBO member here. It somehow blows up because now we have EBO that starts with an 
its own base class, which is empty. And now we have again this empty as a base class. And again, we cannot have the same address because it's the same type of the object. And it blows up. Now we have four integer sizes because this base class needs space, this class needs space, and then there's the int. So be aware, whenever you want to employ empty base class optimization, check. What happened in my library? I actually inherited operators twice and get into problems. There's a question, throw the microphone. So for the EBO struct, you said the empty class, uh, empty base optimization is locked, which means that the base class empty and the member variable P of class empty both occupy space. In that case, a search should be equal to the thing is, these are size of one, and they don't have any alignment restriction. So these are actually directly adjacent, like a char. So they both occupy the same. No, they occupy one uh, one byte and another byte, and oh, then then of the, the in starts. Uh, we don't have ints. We might have words. Okay. So we, we have bytes. That's the memory, how the memory is segmented in the abstract machine. And then due to alignment, we get that int. So we don't get the size of that is, let's say, size of int plus two times size of empty. Because of alignment, the int is aligned to the next integer. We get that alignment of two times int. Another question next. Throw the mic. No, the size of would be two. Yeah, in the able issue, but um, I would not have to pay the size for um, the empty that I inherit, right? Because that, that one actually gets optimized. I only pay it for the. Um, you, pay, you have to pay it because you have two objects of the same type that cannot uh, be on the same address. That's a restriction. Okay. So these actually have two. Bytes. Each has one byte. So it can. Yes. Unless your compiler does some strange alignments for empty objects, which I don't know if it happens on some machine. So the message is don't do these calculations in your head because you're wrong. I might be wrong as well. <laughs> But check when you want to rely on empty base optimization. If you, by happenstance, mix in the same empty base class twice, you end up with bloating your object size without any need. And usually, your code might be wrong. And you will only figure it out later because you get ambiguities. So that's the, the version not that I showed yesterday. But uh, I think we just skipped that because you could watch the other talk or have seen it yesterday uh, what, when I talked about how that works. And this is the example I was talking about, already referring about how to get unique pointers working for C style pointers. If you have C APIs that still return pointers where the interface says, please free that pointer. Uh, I had code like that in my testing framework where CXAD mangle gets me a string that it allocates and it tells me better free that. And the problem is uh, if you copy that around and then call free manually, what, can, what, what problem has this piece of code? Who can see that? Huh? Say it again. Exception it's no longer exception safe. And if the string allocation or the, if there would be more that happening in between, then boom, leak. To, to get rid of that, I used the trick from Stack Overflow, which contains uh, several wrong things. Uh, it takes the, the decal type, standard, the address of standard free. That's not allowed by the standard, not sanctioned by the C++ standard, because all functions in the standard library might actually not be real functions. So you're not allowed to take the address, except you're uh, explicitly allowed to. There are some where you can do that. And then, actually, it defines a unique pointer type that 
takes the character pointer and that's standard free. And it fails to compile because if you call standard free with a const void pointer, that doesn't compile. So, mm. And the unique pointer object is actually two pointers of size because we have the function pointer plus the uh, pointer to be freed. But no more leaks and no, it's exception safe, except that it's invalid code, which compiles. Now, the thing, what you do is actually, or let's say it compiles if you don't do the const thing here. Uh, to actually get it right, generically for all kind of C pointers that you obtain from APIs that you have to free up, you define uh, the leader class that is empty and that overloads the call operator and actually calls standard free and that's okay, you don't take the address, you call it. And to actually make that work, we employ our traits things where we actually do type construction or destruction. We actually take away the const if t is actually a const pointer and uh, then we const cast our pointer value to uh, the non-const version and pass that to free and that compiles because all non-const pointer is automatically um, converted to, to a void pointer and free can actually delete it. And to make that usable, we can actually define an alias for that, where we have our unique pointer for C members, uh, C pointers with our free deleter, and by the magic of unique pointer, it recognizes, okay, this is an empty class, and I do some magic to get, get uh, rid of the extra space for that object, and uh, I'm just the size of a pointer, which is exactly what you do. So if you have a code base that still uses C pointers, that the way to refactor it to get unique pointer semantics and get rid of all the dangling, uh, uh, not all the dangling, all the, uh, the memory leaks that you produce. And this is the check. Like I told you, when you want to rely on empty base optimization, check it with the static assert is that the type of the, uh, the size of your type is actually the size you expect it to be. And now this code, in addition, got simpler, exception safe, and it just works. The only, no, it's the only thing that's different. You might need to uh, get to the raw pointer to actually construct the underlying result uh, here. Questions? Some people were interested. Who, who wants to go home and apply that? A few. Okay. There's another thing that I used to teach, and I was told by people that I shouldn't do te uh, shouldn't teach that. But I still will tell you because C++ 11 introduced a nice feature of inheriting constructors, which makes writing adapter types very easy. And one of the exercises I give my students: write an adapter to set, so you can use index operators for set an indexable set. And it's somehow not actually agreeing to the list of substitution principle, which you should apply to if you inherit from stuff. But we, um, we ignore that in many other cases where we use things like the empty base optimization uh, anyway. So that's why, we, uh, why I ignore it as well. The thing is, it's kind of a, a, a dangerous thing because whenever someone comes up with the idea of actually allocating, you managing, or you wrap adapter type on the heap, and then using delete on a base class pointer, you get a problem. Because your base class was never written in a way to be intended to actually be used in a way that you derive from it. Now people throw out, uh, call out, oh, we have final now. If I would have been, uh, let's say, the, um, the king of C++, I would have never let final into the language. Because all applications of final are premature design optimizations that might just be wrong. It hinders testability and it also uh, 
the benefits you might get from using final in other languages like Java, you never, you don't need or you don't apply to uh, what you get in C++. You only get the uh, the problem that you cannot derive from it uh, from a class, for example, to uh, write a mock object or a, a stub for a test case, for example, that behaves uh, differently from the original class, or to write these adapter classes. Once you only use index and set in your code and never slice it to your base class of standard set, you're just fine. It's not something you should do, let's say, everywhere, but it's if it, you need it, it's very convenient to have these convenient adapters where you inherit from your base class and then use the base class constructors to actually uh, be able to add additional member functions. What I wouldn't do is add additional space, but even that, once you just keep your adapted class, it's quite okay-ish. Just never allocate it on the heap and use a delete on the base class pointer. Next thing, how to hang yourself. Dangling. There was a nice talk last year at ACCU by Jonathan Müller. I just wanted to point to something. I don't agree with everything that he said, but the thing is, referring to other objects in C++, which are objects in the language sense and objects in the OO sense, is useful but it's also dangerous. In the uh, Kona meeting of the C++ committee, we also had a subgroup meeting uh, and uh, together with the uh, working group 23, which is about programming language vulnerabilities. And there Lisa Lippincott came up with a nice term and uh, the, more or less this, these sentences, not exactly, C++ provides a rich set of types whose objects may, may dangle. So they might refer to others that are already dead. And we call these types potentially dangling. If a referred object's lifetime ends before the referring object, one risks undefined behavior. I use something when it's already gone, which actually you might, it's very, very hard to detect at the moment when it takes place. Because even if you delete an object and have another pointer still referring to it or reference to it, it might just still, the bits might just be the same value that they had before, so you don't recognize it. But they might already be taken over by some other object already. So that's the hard part. Who has never had a problem like that? Nobody. That's a typical thing that happens. And you better. Don't want, you don't want to debug that thing. It can be very, very hard. Even in interactive debugging, you don't want to do that. So what can we do about that? So what we do about that is actually using less pointing types. And one, th like, oh, smart pointers work like that. But also the major thing to keep safety is actually write your code in a way that you're pointing types, your potentially dangling types, always die before the object they refer to. Which is good if you pass them down the call chain and nobody down the call chain passes them to another thread. It's safe to use them that way. That's how most of the language work. That's why you could write const reference parameters and pass temporaries because while calling the function, the temporary is kept alive by the language. Whenever you have OO types to actually make use of the V table of the virtual functions, you have to have a reference. You have to have such a pointing thing in your hand to make use of polymorphism. So again, what applies to make use of that virtual functions, you have to use pointing types. So you only write functions taking these uh, things by reference as parameter and never return references. There are a few cases where returning a reference or a pointing type can work, but it usually requires a high burden on the caller who taking the result 
and must ensure to use the result only as long as the original object it refers to is alive and no longer. Fortunately, today compilers warn if I return a reference to a local object. Who has had this error message? Who is still awake? I hope everybody has had this error message once in his life or her life. That's a typical thing. If you look at pointing types, another thing that can happen which requires discipline in programming, if it can be a null, have a null pointer value and then you just use it and there's nothing to refer to, you get undefined behavior, sometimes your program crashes, sometimes you get a signal and sometimes, uh, let's say on most modern systems, you just get at least from the outside recognizable behavior on some embedded systems, you might just read a, a special register at address zero, which can have uh, interesting effects if that is something. So be aware not getting here and be aware to get here. Very often managing types refer to stuff that they hold internally, though they might actually contain pointing types. For example, unique pointer, in contrast to its name, is a managing type that internally has a pointing type, a raw pointer that it manages, but it's not a pointing type except it is nullable. That's a bit, bit of a, a problem there sometimes in its use. But at least if it's nullable, you can detect, you can check if it's null. That's a good thing. If it's dangling, there's no means to detect that something dangles. And I've seen code bases that try to do that by, oh, I have these back pointers to see if things go down and, and then uh, collect all the references. Don't do that. Then you th see things where you just new an object and don't save the, the pointer because it's automatically registered itself somewhere else and you have these circular dependencies of objects where even shared pointer doesn't help you with, uh, you get problems there. So don't come up with ideas to prevent dangling. You can't. Only use discipline. So summary, what can go wrong with potentially dangling types? We have these, even with references, if you pass them out, they can dangle. We have the invalid or null pointers. And one thing never to forget is iterators. And iterators is something all containers provide us factories for iterators, begin and end, for example. And when we use or memorize these iterators beyond the lifetime of the uh, container, they dangle. For most containers, actually changing the container via hold onto an iterator is also making the iterator dangle, except for a few ones where it's defined that they don't dangle. And don't rely on the non-dangling of your iterator that you memorize because when the container while the container changes, because someone might come up and change the container type, and then your code is just wrong. Be careful. That is where you actually need discipline. And the diligence to not make these mistakes. And maybe you have tools that tell you some of the problems, but it's usually undecidable uh, the lifetime. There might be some approaches. Herb Sutter tries to have tools like that. I have a student trying to implement a tool like that, but we're not there yet to have something that works everywhere. Some security checkers do symbolic execution and figure out if you might be able to use a reference or a pointer beyond its lifetime of its uh, pointee or uh, ref referred object. But in general, it's not yet solvable. And in general, especially across compilation units, a compiler will not warn you about. And again, we have more foot guns here with views and spans and string view and take care. Th they are useful. But these are the things that look like values and aren't and give you the problems like pointers give you. OK, I almost told everybody e everything about iterators already. With iterators, we have one more thing. We have things that are like null pointer. 
which we cannot dereference, but we, but we, uh, which we cannot easily detect alone. All end iterators that we get from containers, we can compare to the current end iterator of the container as long as the container doesn't change. That comparison is, is something where we can uh, rely on. But once the uh, container changes, our memorized end iterator from previously might no longer be the same end iterator of the container. And that makes it hard. So if you can use ranges where you shouldn't have these problems ex except for the views, um, and you don't have that. And we have things like the iterators that are default constructed, that are singular, and might also not be very useful. So iterators add to the thing is that we have these special iterators that are not usable, and we cannot detect them on their own that are not usable. Who knows how reference wrapper works? Or who is using reference wrapper in his or her code base? Who has never heard of reference wrapper? OK, I will explain because we have a few there. Reference wrapper, if you have, I have another slide that explains, but I say it now. If you have a member variable where you actually want to keep a reference to another object, if you have a reference member variable, your class is no longer copyable. You lose the ability to copy that, or uh, no, no, sorry, no longer assignable. You can no longer assign and copy. You can you can no longer assign to your class because a reference you cannot reset a reference. It's an alias. It's not a pointer. You cannot reset it, and you lose assignability and also default constructability. Where was that person with about default constructible? You once you have a reference member, you lose default constructability. Reference wrapper instead solves the problem of assignability, but it will not solve the problem of default constructability because it's not default constructible. It cannot be null, even though internally it uses a pointer to represent its, its uh, value. So it can be used to keep your classes regular, except for the default constructability. It can be used uh, in containers to, or uh, somewhere to refer to other things. And sometimes you want to do that because you know the lifetime of things that you uh, access to. And it implicitly converts to reference. And it also provides a generic function uh, operator overload. So you can actually also store function uh, pointers or function references actually in there without uh, problems. And you, const you have two factory functions, ref for L value references and C ref for R value references. Question? In the uh, reference wrapper in the topmost member function, it's a constructor, I believe, yes? Yeah. Uh, Because the type that you are wrapping might have an overloaded uh, ampersand operator. Ah. Okay. Thank you. And address of works. So here we have to use address of, and that's not my code, that's stolen from a central library implementation. Uh, there has to be used address of because the operator ampersand unary might be overloaded in your type T that you're passing. And that's just to make sure that you're not uh, unintentionally call whatever that operator does for you. So again, there's another question in the far back. Now we have a good <laughs> multi-step throw of the microphone. I, I think the question was there. I, I haven't seen your hand, but it was very far. If, if you have copies, that's value semantics, you're fine. No, what, what I mean is you have a class that we, you know, it's, let's say it's a communication class, and it won't allow you to make copies, so it's being disabled. You wrap them in a reference, you can then pass that around to the function that requires those to be copies. 
Well, if you have a class that is non-copyable, you have to pass it by reference. Not if you put it in the reference app. But you again pass it by reference, disguised as reference wrapper. The thing is, you can memorize the reference. Re You can, when you have a member variable that is a reference wrapper, it makes your class copyable or assignable. Assignable. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm getting your use case without seeing the code. Maybe you can, can uh, discuss this afterwards. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, but let's hurry up because I have more to show you and uh, a reference wrapper is only a side thing. We have other things where we people, there are things like the C++ core guidelines that tell you and even Bjarne Strostrup is telling you, use plain pointers to mean single object pointers and not to mean arrays or everything else. My take is if you have a code base where you partially migrate to that philosophy, you never know when you see a star if that pointer is already considered and is just referring to a single object or if that pointer is actually an array or something else. There have been suggestions like using a tag type that just more or less is an alias for a pointer observer pointer, there had been a class called observer pointer that was proposed for the standard, it didn't make it, but I still believe we need a class like observer pointer to actually mark our code bases where we considered the stars and made sure that this pointer actually points to something and it's just one thing. And Unique pointers, they're also in the, in the core guidelines. We have that ownership concept. Is anybody using that owner alias? Don't. Refactor your code to use unique pointer instead, which makes it safe. Um, so owner T is also a bad idea in the core guidelines. Don't do it. Unique pointer, once you touch your code base and you have a, an owning thing, make it a unique pointer and you're done. We have shared and weak pointer that cannot dangle, but you have might have memory dangling, so pseudo leaks. And Nikolai Yusudis Nikola have a, a lot of videos explaining that exactly. Is there a question? <laughs> it's, it's not a leak in the abstract machine, it's just a resource leak that you cannot detect. No, I meant the dangling. Well, <sighs> Let's say deliberate malpractice can always happen. <laughs> if you, it's, let's say, if you have guys running around with a gun, you have no chance if they get guns easily. Yeah. And there's another question. Now you have the microphone already. Please use it. So the thing is, we have this nullable thing. So we have these pointers like object pointer that can be null or even unique pointer can be null. Again, if you have a situation where you can have a thing and don't have the thing, the current solution is use optional. If you have a type that 
has the uh, nullable feature or in this uh, core guideline support library you have that not null thing. Yeah, but again, you, with nullables, it's not a dangling case. You should always check. In a safety critical code, you always check your pointers. Uh, or otherwise prove that they don't, cannot be null. And, and the better thing is use references because it's very hard to get a null reference. That's deliberate. That's, it's like running around with a gun. That's if you, if you get null reference. I think you, you live in a code base where that is true, but I don't want to continue discussing because I have more stuff to, you, to show you. So this is an implementation of Object Pointer by Anthony Williams. He refactored it slightly by feedback from me, and it allows you to get to use Object Pointer as a vocabulary type as your parameter type if you want to pass something that is a pointerish thing, and it automatically converts from a all kind of smart pointers and unwraps the smart pointer to, to pass more or less itself the raw pointer down the call chain, but it actually documents the fact that you have a single object pointer that might be null. You can detect that. It has a, 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 a bool operator or a not operator to detect that in your code base. And this is actually what observer pointer should look like or what non owning pointer should look like. Views and span, I already told you a lot about that. And uh, again, use with care and everything is fine. String view, the same. String view is another thing where you can actually dangle yourself on the gallows. And like pointer, it's a little bit better than, than pointers for strings. And it's more efficient than copying strings around. But better take care that you cannot dangle. Let's say, in the general case, I would say never return a string view. I know that's not true. Some people do return string view with very good and very liberal code, but always know what you're doing and tell your users what they should expect when they get their string view. Whenever you want to use it longer than the original object, please copy. And if you get Give a temporary to a function where you return a string, where you get returned a string view. While it's returned, it might already dangle. Be careful. Pay attention. All these potentially dangling types mean it's not really bad to use them, but you always have to take care. It's a loaded gun you're running around and better put in the safety. Don't use C style pointers. I think we're here. Is anybody still a big fan of pointer arithmetic? <laughs> Shame on you. I know Chandler knows what to do, but uh, also he has a, lo a lot of people around him fixing his bugs, I guess. Or maybe he's fixing his own bugs, or at least detecting his bugs. So um, again, there are situations where you want and need to use pointers like that, but go into your closet encapsulate it and never leak these things to others and don't make that an example for others to use and to mimic. Because if it's used as an example, if you're not of the experience like Chandler who does it every day, even right now, but I guess, uh, you will end up with the situation that people write bad code. It can be very poisonous if you have that as an exemplary code in your code base. So hard hat, work it, and again, temporaries. One idea is, OK, if we don't want to have leaking things from temporaries, like begin iterators, why not have overloads for L value, cons L value, and R values, and never return a, a, 
been iterated to a temporary of your vector. I didn't dare to write a proposal for that, but if there are people working on the standard library or similar things, consider having these three overloads and delete actually the iterators. Or in the case for where you would access a reference, return by value from a temporary by moving it out from the code base. Um, I'm sure it will propose like that will never pass because of, uh, but maybe someone will write it and uh, hand it to Bryce uh, in the uh, library evolution uh, incubator group. Now managing types. We can have managing types that are safe and sane, and one area is the uh, scope-based resource management types or move-only types that work quite well. We already learned about pointing types, only use them down the call chain, and there are different levels of complexity to implement managing types. A common theme, how do I know I have a managing type, is it has a destructor that does clean up, that doesn't have an empty body or is not defaulted. A managing type has some significant side effect in its destructor. It cleans up, it does the housekeeping, it frees memory, it frees the file handler, it just keeps your state of your uh, abstract machine sane. The zero case is something that I only use at a local scope like LockGuard, and there you don't want to have copying or moving because it's never intended to leak somewhere outside because you clean up that you have locally. And this is where we apply the rule of deleted move assignment to get rid of the move, copy, uh, move constructor and to get rid of the copy assignment and the copy constructor. And in C17, you still can return objects of this type from a factory because of return guaranteed return value optimization. In pre-C17, you might have to, uh, to uh, implement or default a move constructor for that. But implementing move, which is the next step, is you get things where you have a uniqueness criteria. The cleanup only happens once. No double freeze. To get there, you need to have something that's often forgotten, a moved from state representation that you dis can distinguish from all the others, and that's typically the state you get when you default construct your managing object. For unique pointer, that's trivial because we have null pointer. Deleting a null pointer is a no-op, safe. Consider unique ref uh, resource, the class that we are working on library in a week after, uh, uh, during lunch break, we need an extra bit to have that same move from state because we cannot guarantee that the type of the resource actually has that extra free space for um, telling us it's moved from or not. And then we have things like vector where we have n values and copying and many things and implementing things like vector requires expert level experience. Very often you can get around by just using vector or vector of unique pointers and wrap it around and then your own class might still be a managing class but you don't have the risk of doing all the other things and very often you, if you really want to have that you might actually make it, that was the microphone still working? It's still working? Uh, so you will have to, you might end up to have something that is non-movable uh, like these and just pass down references to, to your managing object, the call chain, to be able to, uh, let's say, register, uh, working it as a registry, for example. And I will skip my code examples. That's what we're working on. Dynamic polymorphism. Sean Parent and I'm in the same boat. I wouldn't say inheritance is a base class of all evil, but virtual is the base class of all evil. And now this is the table I was referring to yesterday. This is an 
if you def define one of these functions, special member functions or nothing, this is what the compiler provides you automatically. And we have this red area here that is dangerous and we cannot get rid of that because that's our legacy. Now, if you look closely, if we want to have a user declared destructor because we have a virtual member function, we want a virtual destructor, we need to that. But we don't want to have the copying, but we still might want the default constructor. What we are doing is actually, we look here and see if we have a user declared move assignment, we still get the default constructor. We can actually specify the destructor and we get deleted or not declared move and copy operations, so we get rid of slicing. So when we want to de declare a destructor or define a destructor, actually we have to define it, then we delete the move assignment by declaring it as deleted and we end up in the rule of Destemova. And because it's unfamiliar, I had to make up a nice acronym that you can pronounce, Destemova. So you will go home and spread the word rule of Destemova. That is the minimum amount of code if you write a virtual base uh, uh, um, a base class to the hierarchy with virtual member functions to get what you actually need. Uh, that's actually taken from Howard Hinnon's ACCU 2013 uh, talk. You can get it in a, an, in a nicer layout and uh, a lot of explanation how it uh, builds up uh, in, a, in our long talk by Howard. The problem is people don't memorize that and I hope people will memorize rule of Destemova. I'm running out of time so I don't show these code examples Self-study time, that's what I tell my students always. But just see here, we have a drawable base class and we delete the assignment operator, move assignment operator, and then we never have the problem that we slice our classes and we can use things like, oh, a container with unique pointers of drawables and add them to the container, the composite class, and do something about that. We can even use references, it's just a little bit tricky because we would use reference wrapper, but then we have the problem that we actually make sure that all the objects stay alive while the, we use the composite object, which is doable, but mm, easy to misuse. And I don't explain that right now. Look at the slides when I uh, publish them. Um, Type erasure, who, has, who knows how to do type erasure? Who has never heard what type erasure is? A few, and it's only too few, so I won't explain it. And that's a trick. Uh, watch some parents talk and read his papers on how to do type erasure for widgets to actually get, just have value objects and still have polymorphic behavior. There are other options. If the set of different subclasses that you pretend to have is limited and fixed, use variant instead. And this is how Sean Perrin's trick works. And now if you look, that's a different table from before, watch out. We want to have classes that are simple value types and aggregates. This is the area where the rule of zero applies. You might, we might have a default default constructor, but usually if we, have, if we have another constructor, we might get here that we might want to resurrect the default constructor by equals default or we, we might not have uh, to resurrect the default constructor by uh, having these non-default constructible types, but we still everything that's automatically compiler provided is good. Now I'm running into lunchtime. I hope you don't have an appointment sharply because I have more. We have these three areas of manager types, the scope manager, managing, managing type, we have your user-defined destructor and apply the rule of Destemova. We have the unique managing types where we have to implement the destructor and we implement the move assignment by considering what is a move from state, which is kind of tricky. Uh, we have the value managing types where you have to implement all of these. So the rule of five applies, which is kind of, uh, can be challenging. And we have the, uh, 
OO base types where we again apply the rule of distem over to not having these things. And I don't go into the details of implementing OO with value types because that's beyond that. So we want to apply the rule of zero because code that is not there cannot be wrong. And what is happens if we add members to our classes that are not values? If we add members that are values, everything is fine, rule of zero works. If we add reference members, we just learned, okay, we don't have, no longer have a default constructor and we have a deleted assignment operators. If we have things that are scoped, things, we lose the ability to copy things, so it's kind of contagious. Once we have, uh, let's say, a member that is a scope, our class is also scoped, we can no longer copy it. If you have a member that is unique, our class also becomes a unique thing unless we do something about it. If you have a member that is potentially dangling, we better watch out that we don't have the, don't stay copyable. If the dangling type is not a reference, we actually have to make care that we are not easily copyable because at least our type itself becomes a dangling type as well. So these member types or categories are contagious. Watch out for that. Better stay up here in the first line as long as you can. That's the whole story of the talk. And I'm running out of time. Summary, rule of zero, easiest to apply. Rule of Destemova, you know now it's also easy to apply because there's no thinking about it. The rule of three that is adapted, where you actually have a destructor and move operations for unique managing types, you must make sure that you know what the move from the value is of your type. And then for the really experts, we have the rule of five. Don't do that if you're in every class that you write. It's not a good idea. And avoid members of potentially dangling types, otherwise you also become a potentially dangling type and the complexity increases from top to bottom. Takeaways. Model with value types almost. Wrap primitives with whole value, talk from yesterday. Be aware of the required expertise to, and discipline to write types that manage other stuff and OO hierarchies. And remember the rule of Distemova. Make yourself and your environment familiar with it. Spread the word. Samala told you, rule of Destemova is what you want. Be very disciplined about pointing types. Member variables can potentially dangling and taint your code base or your code. And run away from existing code where you have weird special member function combinations. If you see them, usually it means people mix up design or didn't understand the rules well or adapted the code base, try to achieve interesting things, it's usually wrong. It doesn't mean that it might work in your case, but if you happen to, ha to see something like that, put it in the closet, put a sign, wet floor, danger, hard head area, and don't spread it throughout your code base. You don't want to end up with 190 virtual V tables in your single object. Refactor. And I'm over time and done. Questions? If we are allowed to take them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned we are inheriting from empty empty object, and the first member is of uh, of the empty object. Yeah. Of the same empty object. Do you know any particular area where that is applied? No. The uh, let's say having the first member as an empty object and the base class as an empty object, that is rare. It was just to illustrate the situation. But what what happens? And it happened to me yesterday or the day before. I is having unintentionally inheriting from the same empty base twice via the, the 
breadth and height of the height of the hierarchy that you're applying, which is not that hard, but it's a lot doable in C++. You will have a hard time to actually go there, but it come, if it comes from different levels of the uh, inheritance hierarchy, it's doable. And if it's, you can detect it with a static assert. So there are situations where we might end up having twice the same empty base class, which you don't want to, and which uh, uh, is detectable. So that's, I just want to show, and that was the, the simplest piece of code where I could actually show that it happens. I think we should call it a day. Everybody's hungry or tired or uh, whatever. Thank you very much.